I'm thankful to be able to be once before you again on this beautiful Lord's Day. Last time, we had discussed some fundamental principles of science and that of life. And we concluded that there was a necessary cause of the universe. We talked about causality, the law of cause and effect, and how that applies to every aspect of our lives. We also noted in Genesis chapter 1 that in the first week of this universe's existence, three members of the Godhead participated in that creative act. And then we noted the events of the first day of creation. Now I would like to take this morning, the time we have now, to consider the next days of creation. Naturally, that'd be day two. We begin by reading Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. It says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So you might ask, just what is this firmament? Well, it comes from the Hebrew word rakia, which means an expansion, or an expanse, a visible arch of the sky. We would know this better as the earth's atmosphere. We note also the purpose of this firmament in verse 7. It was to divide the waters we saw in day 1. Uh, these are two distinct reservoirs now at this point because of this firmament, this atmosphere. There is the water that exists with the, the matter, and now there's water above that atmosphere. Uh, we, could, we could think of this as a canopy, if you will, uh, in fact, this canopy over the planet is what fell down in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. It says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th, 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. So God reserved this water above the firmament for the cleansing of the sin of Noah's day. We would like to consider what Billy Bland wrote in his lecture several years ago. It says, The firmament is an expansion of atmosphere. On the second day of creation, the waters covering the earth's surface were divided into two great reservoirs, one below the firmament and one above, the firmament being the expanse above earth now corresponding to the troposphere. Then we see in verse 8 that God calls this firmament heaven. Now we've seen throughout this study that the word heaven has been used in different instances. Curtis Cates writes on this, says, Please notice that the waters below the firmament were divided from the waters which were above, not in the firmament. One must not confuse this firmament, the atmosphere, with the firmament where the stars exist. Genesis chapter 1, verses 16 through 17, or with the intermediate state where Lazarus went, in Luke chapter 16, or with the heaven of heavens, where God's throne exists, John chapter 14. The firmament is where the birds fly. So this heaven here is when you go outside and you look around, you see all these cardinals, these blue jays, and the occasional Boeing 737 or 747, that's the sky. That's our firmament. And it does, in fact, serve a purpose. Now, certainly, we've mentioned several times that the Bible is not a book or a science book, but where it does speak on science, it is absolutely correct. But you will not find the scientific terms that we commonly use today. We had to get there first. 
So there's different scientific principles that we as humans had to classify and to give names to. Now, God says the firmament was created. Now, we know our atmosphere, and there's different layers of that atmosphere. There's primarily five different layers. And depending on which scientist you ask, the fifth one may or may not be considered a layer. But we're going to mention it anyway because we want to cover all of our bases. The first layer is the troposphere. And that extends from sea level up to about six miles. And this is where generally all of our weather occurs. Uh, you see all the clouds, the different storm cells that you can see from your favorite weather station. It's within this layer of the atmosphere that we really have our being, our daily activities conducted. We notice that the mixture of gases primarily consists of nitrogen at 78%, oxygen at 28 or 21%, and there's various others at 1%. We're not going to spend all, a lot of time on that. There's various different compounds, different chemical names for those. But primarily, we're concerned about that second one, oxygen. Take a deep breath. Now exhale. You just took in air. Primarily oxygen that your body needs to survive. God has put this mixture into the atmosphere. And it has done quite a good job of sustaining us thus far. If, if you consider an internal combustion engine, it will not run well on pure oxygen. In fact, you'll have less power than you would under current circumstances. That has a lot to do with the nitrogen that is in the air. There, there's a lot of benefits that come along with this mixture. It's not just a random mixture of gases. There is design and purpose behind them. Secondly, we would consider the stratosphere. This extends to about 31 miles above sea level. This is where we know of the ozone level existing. We've heard quite a bit of that in recent history, the ozone layer. This layer absorbs primarily the most of the UV coming from the sun. It, pr it protects us. So again, design and purpose. Third, we have the mesosphere. And this extends about 53 miles above sea level. This is where meteors typically burn up. They're big enough to hit the earth and they made it past that test, but typically anything that hits our planet is going to be dissolved by this mesosphere. Uh, it's interesting to know that the temperature in this particular layer is about negative 130 degrees Fahrenheit, give or take a few degrees. Then there's the thermosphere. And this ranges between 311 to 620 miles above sea level. This layer also blocks UV rays, but it also filters out X-rays. I don't know about you, but I don't like having X-rays pointed at me on a regular basis. I don't like them at all. I've only had to do that once. But every time, the doctor says, okay, it's going to be all right. And then they leave the room. Is it really going to be all right? Well, thankfully, God designed this thermosphere to block out those X-rays. This is also where the aurora borealis occurs. I'm sorry, I haven't got there yet. This is, uh, actually it is, I'm sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. This is, in fact, where the aurora borealis occurs. We can see the particles, if you will, dancing on this layer of the atmosphere. As the particles from the sun engage and interact with our atmosphere, it makes a marvelous light show. I would like to witness that one day. Um, it's all these different particles interacting with the earth, our magnetic field, and really God's design. The temperature there is about 932 degrees Fahrenheit and could rise up to 3600 degrees Fahrenheit. It's not exactly a place you want to be. It might even be hotter than Texas. Now, the, the layer of the atmosphere that we mentioned earlier that some might debate over whether or not it, it exists as a layer of the atmosphere is considered the exosphere. This ranges from 6,200 miles above the Earth, even closer to the moon. 
it's really more of a, um, a buffer between space and the earth, um, or a trans transition state, if you will. Um, it's not really clearly defined. Nonetheless, that is our atmosphere. Now, there's certainly other things we could consider, but for our study this morning, that will be sufficient. God created this atmosphere for the good of the earth, for the good of his creation. And then we note again in verse 8 of Genesis 1, where he prescribes this as being a calendar day, a 24-hour period of time. So we would like to consider the next day. Genesis chapter 1, verses 9 through 13, if you'd like to follow. It says, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit yielding tree, fruit after his kind whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. So we see here in verses 9 and 10 of Genesis 1 that God is organizing, has organized the waters that exist, and he called them seas. We might refer to them as oceans. Some of them are seas to us, but it's still the large body of water upon the planet. We also note in those two verses that God called the dry land. He even prescribed it as being earth. Then we see that God caused the plants to be, verses 11 and 12. Now, if you'd like to take note, this is a logical progression. As a gardener, as one of us, as those, you know, depending on some who you talk to, brainless farmers, typically you would like to water the soil and lay seed to grow a crop. Well, this, this soil, this earth that has just been called into or out of the water was fully saturated. Certainly you'd have a very prosperous crop to any farmer. If in saturated soil. And then now God says, let the earth bring forth grass. You have this soil fully saturated with water. It is prepared to do so. Excuse me, it is prepared to do so. Now this is also the first mention of kind. This is not the same sense as what we typically refer to as a species, but it is a kind. Henry Morris points out, I'd like to, to mention his quote this morning. It says, in verse 11 occurs the first mention of both seed and kind. Implanted in each created organism was a seed programmed to enable the continuing replication of that type of organism. The modern understanding of the extreme complexities of the so-called DNA molecule and the genetic code contained in it has reinforced the biblical teaching of the stability of kind. There is a tremendous amount of variational potential within each kind, facilitating the generation of distinct individuals and even many varieties within the kind, but nevertheless precluding the evolution of new kinds. A great deal of horizontal variation is easily possible, but no vertical changes. Well, all that means is, did God have to create every single plant that we see today in day three? No. He created plants. Now, do we know exactly what there were was in existence at this time? No, but he said they were. Herb yielding seed, there's fruit. There's fruit trees in existence, there's grass. There exists within the kind the ability to produce new species within that kind. Now, we're going to talk more about that later with other aspects of creation. But you will never find a prickly pear cactus turning into a coyote. That's exactly the same type of kind with changing into another kind that evolution would have you believe. 
That is not what's being spoken about here. You might have God's plant, whatever it might have been, and it might yield other plants through pollination, cross-pollination, and process of time. But it's still a kind of plant. It's still a kind of fruit tree. You know, my grandfather likes to graft fruit trees. And there are certain kinds that will allow for grafts. You won't find a pecan being grafted into a blueberry bush. Yes, it's a plant, but those are not compatible. But he does have a pecan tree with about seven or eight different types of pecans. And you can go over there and you can go look at them. Different sizes pecans. His favorite are the paper shell. Nice pecans, easy to get into. It also attracts a lot of squirrels, which he has a field day with. Nonetheless, these are kinds, and you do not find one kind magically changing into another kind through process of evolution. For that is exactly what that theory is, a form of magic. And magic does not exist. We would like to note some things that I myself have not prior thought of. But these plants were brought forth. They are not living. Creatures are found to be living. We note in Genesis chapter 1 verse 21. Now a plant may grow, it may flourish. It can also wither and fade. But it does not die in the sense of being separated, a spirit being separated from a body. Plants do not have blood. We know in Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 that life is in the blood. Uh, back in the day of the, Re the Revolutionary War and times thereafter, we, we put leeches on people to suck out the blood because we thought that was poison. We found out later you do it too long, they kill over. Life is in the blood. Plants do not have blood. Now biologically speaking, they are living. But biblically speaking, they are not. They lack consciousness. Now they can grow, they can reproduce, but they are not biblically alive. God commanded the eating of plants in Genesis chapter 1 verse 21. We note that there was no death until after Adam and Eve sinned. Genesis chapter 3 verse 19. We know that man is the result, or caused rather, sin. He transgressed God's will and sinned. And through that sin came death. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 and 14. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, as well as eight chapter, or chapter 8, verse 22. It was not until after the flood, Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, that man was permitted to eat animals. So you have all these plants being consumed by mankind as well as the animals, but not considered death. So plants are not conscious. Plants are not biblically alive. Again, we wish to point out, verse 13, that God prescribed this as a 24-hour period. He did so by the, the Hebrew word yom. Now, after day three, of course, is day four. I would like to take the remaining moments to discuss with this day four. There, in, still in Genesis 1, beginning of verse 14, says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven, to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven, to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So God made the lights of heaven. Now we must keep in, in mind that this heaven mentioned is not where God reigns. And it is not our atmosphere. This is the same heaven as mentioned in verse 1. This is space. Our universe at large. 
we find the purpose of these lights, and they are to give light to the earth. We see that the sun is to rule the day. We also know that the moon is to rule the night. And that these, these newly created lights are also to be for man to keep time. We know that our calendar is based on a solar calendar. We use revolutions of our planet with respect to the, earth, or to the sun to keep time. We know as, as this planet revolves around the sun once, it's considered a year. And whenever the moon revolves around our planet, it's usually considered a day by most people. Again, citing Henry Morris, he says, On the first day, God said, Let there be light. The Hebrew word, or. On the fourth day, he said, Let there be lights, plural. Or light givers, which is the Hebrew word, ma'or. Intrinsic light first, then the generators of light. Is both the logical and the Bible order. The chief purpose of both the light of the first three days and the light givers of all latter days was to provide or was to divide the light from the darkness, verses 4 and 18. The duration of the days and night was the same in each case, and the directions of light emanation on the earth from space must have been the same in each case. So if you will remember, the light of day one, God called into existence and it had a purpose. It was not until day four, as we just read about, that he gave the light givers. Curtis Cates points out, Might not God have created localized light to come to earth as, it, as if from the sun, and then three days later create the sun, when he created the other stars, whereby he could keep the electromagnetic radiation coming and thus be able to walk off and leave it? That's not exactly what God did. In fact, he didn't do that. But for lack of better terminology, we'll use that. When one realizes that God created the stars, the host of heaven, on day four for man's benefit, to be signs and for seasons and for days and years, to give light upon the earth, he sees that the necessity of God's having created the stars as well as the light for those stars as if the light had emanated from them for billions of years. Else Adam would have seen very, very few stars. An appropriate question is, what would be most difficult for God? Create the sun first, the light first, or both at the same time? Which is less difficult for God? The light created on day one must have been of the same nature and in the same degree as that produced by the sun on day four. The sun would simply be God's method of giving the light permanence, producing and governing the light through the laws of nature. We could say the same about the stars. The moon does not make light in and of itself. It reflects the sun's light. Now, it's not gone into great depth of detail, it's just a small phrase in verse 16. He made the stars also. I know in, in Cameron and as certainly as well as other small towns, whenever it got dark outside, you could go to your backyard and look up. And you could see all these pretty stars. You can't really do that in larger cities because of the light pollution. But you could see these stars very well. Now, just what does he mean by these stars? Well, certainly like we just said, look up at night. You'll find out. These are the constellations. There are many times where constellations are mentioned in Scripture. We find mention of Arcturus in Job chapter 9, verse 9. That is the great bear. We know it better as the, the Big Dipper which is a portion of Ursa Major. Orion and Pleiades are mentioned in Job chapter 38, verse 31. I always like looking at Orion. You could always see his belt, which were the three stars, and you could see him wielding his weapon. Then you have mention of Maseroth in Job chapter 38, verse 32. There's a lot of 
discussion over what this this really is, but it is a constellation. The 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 leading thought of it is that it's the signs of the zodiac at large. Uh, you know that you can take that and make it into a religion as many people have, but I look at it from the standpoint of that's a pretty set of stars up there. Since I was born in May, my zodiac sign is the bull, the Taurus. Well, there's others that might have the dragon or snake or whatever. But these are just pictures that people have made using stars. They're constellations. Maseroth seems to indicate the entire group of the zodiac. And then in Job chapter 26, verse 13, it says that God has formed the crooked serpent. That seems to indicate the constellation Draco, the dragon. Now one issue that many try to point out with creationism, with even a young earth, that concept is considered stupid by many that are in the elitist, highly educated group. But the problem that they try to point out is the, the issue of distant starlight. If indeed it is the case that God created all these, why, does the, why do the stars appear to be so far away? Nine billion light years away. In fact, that seems to be the, the farthest star from us as we found in 2018, and it's been named Icarus. Nine billion light years away. That would mean it takes light nine billion years to get to Earth. We would like to point out Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1, Isaiah 40, verse 22, chapter 42, verse 5, as well as Psalm 104, verse 2. Chapter 12, verse 1 of Zechariah reads, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretched, stretcheth forth the heavens, and layeth the foundations of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. If you read over that pretty quickly, you're going to miss the whole point we're trying to make. The Lord which stretches forth the heavens. Now this term stretching or stretcheth or stretched can be used in a couple of different ways. But it's used here as stretching out as if it were a tent. Now if you've ever put up a tent, you start here and then you open it up. And you've got your canvas that you're going to sleep under. Start in a central point, and you go out. That's exactly what God did with creation. We know in verses 1 through 5 that we have space, we have matter, we have all that's in existence. And then God says he stretched it out. Scientific term for that is dimensional folding. I like to think of that more or less when you go buy a bag of curtains, or particularly a set of curtains, you have a nice little folded pack. You pick out your favorite color, or rather your wife's favorite color. Say, okay, honey, this is what we're going to put up. And then you rip open that package, and you unfold it. And you have a six-foot by six-foot curtain. And you go hang it up. And it provides what you want it to. But you start in a box, or a pack, a bag. And then you open it up. Before we started using cell phones for navigation, what did we have? We had those maps that nobody could refold. <laughs> but it fit into a little, a little rectangle, about yay big. You want to figure out where you're going, and you unfold it. It's pretty simple. But the creator of our universe says he stretched everything out, stretched out the heavens that very easily dispatches the concept of an old universe. Now the next point I'd like to show is the idea of exploding stars with respect to the age of the universe. I stumbled upon this not too long ago, so I decided I would use it for this lesson because I thought it was extremely fascinating. According to generally accepted theory, as a star burns up, burns out its full source, it collapses and then explodes. This phenomenon is called a supernova. And based on the number of stars in our galaxy and other calculations, there should be another supernova 
every 25 years. After a star explodes, it produces a large cloud of debris. This is how we're able to find a supernova, looking for the evidence. There is evidence, there's these clouds of debris throughout our universe. And there's 200 supernovas. We'll do the math. 25 years multiplied by 200 supernovas is how many years? 5,000. Does that sound familiar? Maybe perhaps with the biblical concept of how old this earth is? Now, if the earth is truly 13.8 billion years old, as many would have you believe, and following the same math, do you know how many different supernovas we should observe? It's over 500 million supernovas. We don't see them. They aren't there. Thus, we must be living in a much younger universe than 13 billion years of age. I found a quote the other day. It says, whenever the Bible and the scientists disagree, just give the scientists more time. I like that. Because not just scientists, but all of us. Sometimes we need more time. Thankfully, not only can we read about an almighty and all-powerful God doing these things, creating the world, creating the universe, creating all that is therein, Aside from his power, he's long-suffering. He is a just God. He is a merciful God. But it's that long-suffering that allows this globe to keep spinning. Now, that long-suffering will not negate his justice. Time will be called to a close. We find in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 through 10, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will sh or shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall burn with a fervent heat, and the earth also and the works that are therein shall all be burned up. He created everything in existence, and he and he alone has the right to destroy it. As we just read, it's going to be called into clothes through heat. Now, you can, you can take a look at how many scientists believe the earth is going to end, and they'll say it's a heat death. So, see, there's a few things that we can agree on. This world is going to end in fame. But it's going to be God that calls it to an end, not random processes of evolution and, and death through natural selection. And it's not even going to be humans through global warming, so-called. It's going to be God when he says, that's it. That being the case, we do not know when God's going to end this planet, in this time that we know of. We need to be prepared, therefore. As we just read in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, he wants all men everywhere to repent. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. As such, he's given us the plan to reconcile ourselves to him. If you're not a Christian, you can take the steps this morning to become one by hearing the gospel, Romans 10, 17, by believing in Christ, John 8, 24, by repenting of your sins, Acts 3, 19, confessing Christ before others, Romans 10, verses 9 through 10, and then finally putting your Lord on in baptism, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. At that point, You've been reconciled to your creator. We typically call the creation the, the general revelation. And his word special revelation. You need to be familiar with it. Otherwise you will never be pleasing to your creator. By the way, if there's a creator, we're subject to him. We are under his rule. This is why the atheist doesn't like God. It's not necessary that they fully believe that God does not exist. They can't stand that someone has authority over them. And it is the, church, the church's job to take this authority, to shine forth the word of God, his gospel, to teach them out of their ignorance 
and out of their sin to bring them back to their creator. If you need to become a Christian, take the next few moments to do so. If you are a child of God, but yet through, through sin and your disregard for his authority, please repent and pray. We'll pray with you, for you, as together we stand and sing.